Hello there and welcome to video number five, the final video in this um, series on extinctions where we'll be looking at what is happening on Earth today. And that is the sixth mass extinction, I'm afraid, so it's not going to be pretty. Um, so let's have a first look at kind of the context for, for today, for what's happening now. And having looked at the five previous mass extinctions, we can, we can for example, start to ask, well, is that it for mass extinctions? Is, is that it? Um, are we done? Uh, I'm afraid the answer is no. So in the late quaternary, from about 50,000 to about 3,000 years ago, we have seen um, some significant extinctions amongst uh, mammals in particular. So in that time period, 65% of mammal, mammal genera weighing over 44 kilograms have been extinct. These are the things that we call the megafauna. As you can see from these graphs, this happens on all continents. Here you can see the distribution of body masses in terms of the number of species. Here, or towards the right of the graph, are our megafauna, and the black blobs show the portion of this megafauna that has gone extinct on those different continents. So there is a strong pattern of extinction that's being concentrated into these organisms of higher body mass. This is during a time when, admittedly, climate has relatively quickly warmed from cold and arid in the Pleistocene to the warm interglacial Holocene from about 11,000 years ago. And there's a reasonably well-documented coincidence between the timing of these extinctions and the arrival of modern humans. Obviously, correlation doesn't equal causation, but in many of these cases, we have a clear mechanism by which humans may be making these animals go extinct. But I also wanted to point out that this isn't just the megafauna themselves. Megafauna are often keystone species within their ecosystems. Their disappearance is thus bad news. So it's safe to say that historically, humans do not have a brilliant track record of not causing large levels of extinction though obviously there are multiple factors, including climate change, um, in this pattern. But, you know, that's the context of where we are now. And we may be um, kind of thinking now at this point, well, we're more aware of the impact we're having on the environment now, so this must have stopped by this point, right? I'm afraid that's wrong. So extinctions um, can be plotted to show the rates of extinction in different groups, such as birds and mammals, or other groups over historical times, so the time um, where we've actually got historical records. There are a number of papers that do this, and on the right-hand side here, I've chosen an example from birds. So the rate of extinction for birds is about 1.75 species per year, and you can see the distribution of, of um, extinctions on this graph. They bear in mind that obviously there are biases based on how likely we are to be recording the presence and the extinction of birds. But even though, e ignoring that, taking this average of 1.75 um, extinctions per year within the birds, we've lost about 1% of living birds since the year 1600. If we extrapolate that rate of loss to all 20 to 100 million living species of organism, obviously, these big error bars once more, the current rate of extinction is about 5,000 to 25,000 species per year, or between 13 to 70 species per day. And again, big error bars, but nevertheless, that is a very high rate of extinction. If we were to extrapolate that um, to the future, that would mean that all life, including presumably us, would be extinct between 800 years from now and 20,000 years from now. Obviously, that is not a statistically sound thing to do. Once you've lost the majority of species, it may well be that extinction rates are slow. But nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that est the estimates say we are between 100 and 1,000 times higher in terms of our current extinction rate than the extinction rate that we have calculated based on fossils over geological time. This is problematic. On the basis of that extinction rate alone, it's not in the slightest bit an exaggeration to say that we are slap bang in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. It's currently happening around us. This is the first mass extinction in the geological record that we know of, in which a single species has caused that mass extinction. There are many factors in our behaviour that are leading to extinctions. I'll highlight two primary ones here. The first is habitat alteration, caused by human activities. And the second is anthropogenic climate change, which I felt were both summed up moderately nicely by this William Blake print here. 
So why does this matter? Well, we've I covered this in the first video, and uh, I you know I we can have a argument uh, debate about whether we should try and save species for its own sake, um, and I think that is a, uh, a debate that I would be willing to uh, moderate if you want to talk about it in Zoom. I don't really believe it needs justification that we shouldn't uh, destroy other species, but we should also look at the fact that biodiversity does a lot for us humans. In terms of enacting policy, for example, to overcome the current situation, um, policy um, tends to care about the impacts on humans, and we can play that game, right? These natural processes that um, ecosystems provide us with support human life. We call these ecosystem services. Examples of ecosystem services are um, how nature and natural um, uh, ecosystems can help us reduce the impact of floods. They can help us decompose our waste. Insects and other organisms can pollinate our crops. Animals purify our water and keep our soil fertile. Such factors are very easy to ignore until they fail. So I want to dig a tiny bit deeper into one example of what's happening at the moment. And that is to look at the insects. So insects are a really important group of animals. The insects are a member of the large group, the arthropods. These are animals that are united by having a chitinous uh, exoskeleton. That's a, a, an exoskeleton that's made of a thing called chitin. Um, they are uh, took to land. Uh, once, sometime before 315 million years ago. We'll learn more about that process in our lecture on the evolution of life on land. That's the very last lecture of this series. They are united by having three pairs of legs, um, and many have two pairs of wings, such as this beautiful um, uh, praying mantis on the left-hand side here. They're a really diverse group both in terms of their disparity. So there are lots and lots of different body forms within this group, some of which you can see in this beautiful image on the right hand side here. But also that's true in terms of their diversity. By all estimates, as this infographic shows, insects make up more than 50% of all described species. And by many estimates, they make up more than 80% of described species. So we're looking at a super duper abundant and thus really important group. There are loads of these suckers around. Or at least that's true, historically speaking. We'll get onto that in a bit. In fact, the insects are a great example of those ecosystem services that I was talking about because they pol pollinate many of our major crops. Indeed, if we were to put a global uh, a value on this in terms of money, because that is often important when it comes to forming policy for reasons that are largely to do with humans. Um, but if we put a, a monetary value on the services that insects provide us with, the global economic value of just the pollination services that insects perform is around $217 billion per year. Right, so that's a, that's a very valuable contribution to um, human endeavors, right? No matter which way you cut it. And you can see the, the massive diversity of this group compared to, say, um, the 5,500 mammals that we have described. These really are, um, um, the insects are a really major, major group. And indeed, the second biggest, most diverse group of animals after the insects are another, is another group of arthropods, the primary pair of the insects, the arachnids. But there you go. Um, we can talk about that in the Zoom if you want to. To date, the only mass extinction that we've learned about in this series of videos that in any way hit the insects was the Permo-Triassic extinction. In this extinction, a number of orders went extinct. And I've put a, a series of examples of the, the, the orders that went extinct on this slide here. Um, they include the um, Megasicoptera. These, these are like some really massive, well, they grew quite large. Um, relatives of dragon and damselflies, and the Paleodictyoptera. So these are um, some really quite cool, but slightly weird looking insects. These are juveniles down here. These are adults. Some of them even have prothoracic winglets. These are kind of like mini wings that occur on the first segment of the abdomen in these groups where no modern insects have wings at all. So these are really um, uh, 
potentially exciting glimpse into what precursors to insect wings may have been. But that's a whole different thing entirely. So other than these groups that went extinct during the Permo-Triassic extinction, insects survived pretty much unscathed through all other major catastrophes. The other major event that we should mention within this context occurred sometime after the origin of angiosperms, probably in the Cretaceous. Insects started pollinating angiosperms, so that's flowering plants, and both groups underwent an evolutionary radiation. They co-evolved together um, and have a strong relationship even today. So insects are, in summary, vital to us. Uh, they have a vital role in many food webs, um, and they've only been hit by one mass extinction in the past. So the insects were a major group, and they're super important to us. How are they doing today? Not well, I'm afraid. This image is taken from a recent study that looked at the biomass of insects. This was measured um, using traps deployed over 27 years in 63 nature protection areas in Germany. So this was a, a study that was looking at the, or estimating the total biomass of insects based on those that were captured over 27 years. And you can see from the graph on the left-hand side here that insect biomass shown on the y-axis here is declining through time. These colors correspond to time as well. And as you can see on this graph showing insect biomass throughout the year, we go from blue to yellow. So based on this study, uh, biomass is declining, whichever way you look at it. If you want some facts and figures, um, the study estimates a seasonal decline of 76%. Um, the midsummer decline of flying insect biomass is 82% over the course of this 27 year study. That's really significant. Um, this paper here, Sanchez Bio um, in 2019, uh, suggests that 40% of insect species are currently threatened with extinction. And I'm afraid this is on us. Habitat loss, um, by conversion to intensive agriculture is the main driver of the declines in these insect groups. Secondary causes, also on us. Those are agrochemical pollutants, invasive species, and climate change. All things that we know that human activity is responsible for. And in case you think this is isolated, there are a great many studies showing that this is happening in different parts of the world in different groups. So this looks like a real pattern. Um, in the case of the insects, the scale, the distribution, and the nature of this decline is a topic of very active research. And I wanted to show a quick counterexample so you can try and weigh up what you think may be happening yourselves. This is a paper that came out uh, this year and studied the US rather than Europe. So the last study was based in Europe. Here we're based in the US. And this has different patterns of land use. So the US has different patterns of land use to Europe. And in this case, the authors report the net abundance and biodiversity trends are generally indistinguishable from zero throughout the course of these many studies. So this is actually a um, meta-analysis. So that could be seen as positive, but I note the authors on this study still conclude this result does not diminish the need for continued monitoring and can mask subtle changes in species composition that nonetheless endanger insect-provided ecosystem services. So even in this study, um, the authors are quite cautious about what may be going on. So where does that all leave us? I would like to leave you on, on a happy note, and I'm afraid I, um, I pretty much can't do on the base of this material, so I'll post a picture of some, or a video of some cute animals just below this video on the web page. In terms of the insects, we can say that these animals are integral to every, every terrestrial food web, um, they're food to numerous birds, bats, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. They perform a multitude of roles for us, including pollination, pest control, and nutrient recycling. Terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems will collapse without insects. Yet, it looks very much like from the majority of studies that our um, behavior, our activities, are strongly impacting on the diversity and the biomass of the insects that we share our ecosystems with. More broadly, as I hope I've convinced you over the course of this video, we are increasingly certain that we're witnessing the sixth mass extinction. You may start seeing uh, this referred to if you do some reading as the Holocene or the Anthropocene extinction. 
And we have a great deal of evidence that this is happening globally in many different groups. So the major question that we are faced with now is what we could do to counteract our impact or indeed understand our impact in the light of previous mass extinctions. So that will be covered, um, the latter part, and to an extent the former part in another uh, lecture or video series for this particular course, Conservation Paleobiology. For those of you on the um, EECB pathway in ease, you'll be learning a lot more about conservation over the course of your degree here. But for now, that I'm afraid is the depressing note we have to end on. That is the current mass extinction within the context of the mass extinctions that have come to date. So I will leave you there. Do, if you feel the need, scroll down and watch that cute animal video. And I will see you for our next series of videos. Bye.